fed these 5,000 men and a lot of women and children, the number of women and children, was not numbered. The very next day in the synagogue over in Capernaum, across the sea, that very same crowd that had taken the loaves and the fishes from the hand of Christ and by the miracle that he performed out of compassion for them, rejected him and turned away from him when he offered them really spiritual food instead of just material position. They wanted him to be a political messiah that would free them from the Roman yoke right then and there. They didn't want anyone that would give them eternal life. They didn't want anyone that would show them the way to live. Men have always rejected the message that God sent, and God sent this message by Jesus Christ as he had sent the message by all of his prophets, as he had proclaimed it in the antediluvian days by Noah, as he had told it himself to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Well, later, of course, they crucified Jesus Christ, and because of what he said and because of his message, not because of what he was or what he did. Why is it then that men will not accept his message even today? Why is it that it isn't popular to preach it? Why is it that if you dare to preach the same thing that Jesus Christ did, that people will persecute you, that they will hate you, they will despise you, they will try to discredit you, they will do everything they can, because they are not fighting me, they are fighting God Almighty. They are fighting Christ. And because they don't love Christ, they don't love his way, they don't love the message that he brought, the way that he proclaimed, which is the way into everything that everybody wants. Well, you've heard of a dog biting the hand that fed it. You don't read it that very often. But it's, it's a saying that has been going around, although I don't think dogs do that very often. But human beings will do it. Yes, they will do it. And here's exactly where that happened. Now it was on the next day after Jesus Christ had fed these, and you know as he, the disciples got in the boat to cross the sea, and the, uh, Jesus was not with them, and then they saw him walking on the water, and you remember how Peter asked him if he could walk on the water. Jesus said, come, and Peter, looking straight at Christ, got out, and he walked on the water too. So it wasn't merely Christ who was doing the miracles. He did nothing that we couldn't do. He said that of himself he could do nothing. It was the Father that dwelt in him that did all of the works. And if we let the Father, through his Holy Spirit, dwell in us to the extent that he did in Jesus Christ, we could do the same things today. And even Peter was able to walk on the water, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. But then he began to look down, he saw the troubled waters, he saw the storm. And the minute he saw that, that was on his mind. And as soon as the material circumstances and the troubles were on his mind, his faith left him. You know, today we look at the material circumstances. We just look at the possibilities of everything going wrong. We can't get our eyes on God and keep them there and trust him. We just can't do it, can we? So now on the next day, the multitude which stood on the other side of the sea where he had been, and remember, he didn't seek this multitude. You'll remember that he was trying to get away with his disciples for a little rest. He was tired, and they were all tired. They'd been working so hard, the physical body will get tired. And uh, they were getting in a boat to go away by boat up the shore to a place farther up where they would get away from the people. But the crowd saw them going, and they went up the shore on land. They beat them there, arrived ahead of Jesus and the disciples in the boat. And that's where he fed them, because they had just run up there without thinking. People don't seem to think in these days any more than they did then. I guess people never did think very much, most of them. It seems they let a few people do the thinking for all the rest of them. And they don't want any of God's thinking. They just want a little human thinking. Well, anyway, they arrived up there, and out of compassion, he performed this miracle and fed them all. And then again, he was walking on the water, and the disciples were crossing the sea, the Sea of uh, Galilee up there in the northern part of Palestine. And uh, now they had come across to Capernaum. But here was the multitude which stood on the other side of the sea, they saw that there was none other boat there save one, and uh, that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, 
but that the disciples went away alone, howbeit there came boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. But when the multitude therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they themselves got into the boats, and they came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, and now in Capernaum, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? They didn't know how he got there. He hadn't gotten into the boat. Well, of course, they didn't know he had been walking on the water until he came to the boat where the disciples were. So they asked him, When did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Work not for the meat, and meat in the King James or the old revised version from which I'm reading here, not this modern revised version, but the older one is the one I happen to have. And um, The word meat there really means food. It doesn't mean animal flesh necessarily. It might include that, of course, but it also might mean fruit, vegetables, bread. It is referring to food. Work not, then, let me just use that correct word in modern English, work not for the food that perishes, but for the food which abideth unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him the Father, even God, hath sealed. They said therefore unto him, What must we do that we may work the works of God? Now here is the work of God and the works of God. There's a great deal said in the Bible, incidentally, about God's work and the work of the eternal and the work of God that is to be done on the earth. Yes, God has his work that he does through his own human instrumentalities. And now the work of God was something that they were to lend themselves to if they were God's children, if they were submissive to him. Well, they were asking the question what they would have to do. Not that their hearts were as willing as their curiosity, but they at least were curious to know. And so we'll see a little more about that as we we'll go along. So they asked him, what must we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now, Men may have believed on the person of Christ, but never did they accept his message, except a very few. They said therefore unto him, What then doest thou for a sign that we may see and believe thee? They wanted some proof. Now a sign in Bible language, remember, is a miracle that identifies. And they wanted a sign now to identify that he was the Messiah, even though he had performed that great miracle and fed all of them by a miracle. They still wanted another proof, a miraculous proof of his identity and who he was. What then doest thou for a sign that we may see and believe thee? What workest thou? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Now Jesus had just <laughs> performed a miracle to give them bread to eat. And notice how they are now. They're human. Jesus therefore said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, it was not Moses that gave you the bread out of heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which cometh down out of heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now he's talking about bread in a spiritual sense, not material bread that is made from actual wheat that grows out of the ground. He is talking now of the spiritual food that will feed us and develop in us the very character of God and the nature of God, which of course God must instill, but will develop the nature of God and build the very character of God until we are less human and more godlike all the time. And then, of course, if we are now begotten and if we grow in that begetful state and uh, are more like God by feeding on the spiritual bread, and that comes by the study of the Word of God and obedience to it and through a great deal of prayer and communion with God, fellowship with God's own people, withdrawing from the world, except that we must go into the world to do the work of God and to proclaim His message, but not fellowshipping the world. And if we grow in that way, God will then change us instantly at the second coming of Christ if we are alive at that time, or resurrect all of those who have died 
in that condition to immortal life into the very family, the kingdom of God. Jesus therefore said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, It was not Moses that gave you the bread out of heaven, for my Father giveth you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said therefore unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Now they just wanted to receive it, but they didn't want to do anything about it. They didn't want to repent. They didn't want to obey. They just wanted to go on with their stubborn rebellion in their own way, doing the thing that seemed right to them, following the appetites and the lusts of the flesh, and just have God or have Jesus here give it to them. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that you have seen me, and yet believe not. All that which the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. You know, today everyone wants to do his own will. He doesn't want to do the will of God. Well, now, if Jesus couldn't do his own will, how do you think you're going to get away with it and still be converted and share with Jesus all of the inheritance that is his? Well, there it is. That's the teaching of Jesus all the way. And he taught that eternal life is the gift of God. We don't have it. We can only get it as God's gift. And he said, This is the will of my Father, that everyone that beholdeth the Son and believeth on him should have eternal life. They don't already have it, but they are to gain it. They are to receive it. And then he said, I will raise him up at the last day in a resurrection to eternal life. Now, my friends, Christ only hath immortality, so says your Bible. And you turn over here to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And we read this, that in the beginning of the 50th verse, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, and that's what we are, flesh and blood, that's what you are, it's what I am, we all are that. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, nobody has inherited that but Jesus Christ. We're only heirs. None of us has yet inherited it. No one who has ever died has inherited it, my friends. If you think that some of your loved ones have already inherited the kingdom of God, well, then uh, they have inherited it uh, quite a while before Abraham. But you know the sermon for which Stephen was martyred, he was stoned to death, in that sermon, he said that Abraham had not yet received that uh, promise of God. And you know, to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul said, If you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's children and heirs according to the promise. Now, every Christian can become an heir, but he is an heir of the promise made to Abraham. Can he then, if he's one of Abraham's children and an heir of what is Abraham's, can he inherit it even before his father, Abraham? If Abraham becomes his father, and the promise was made to Abraham, and he inherits it because he is in Abraham's family, or a spiritual Israelite, if you please, how is he going to inherit it even before Abraham? Now let me turn over here to Hebrews and the faith chapter and show you the faith that Abraham had and what it says about him. The 11th chapter of Hebrews and in the 8th verse, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed. He should after receive this land of Palestine on this earth as an inheritance, and he obeyed. How did he obey? By faith. By faith he obeyed. You see how his faith was used to obey, and how it was mixed with obedience. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. That's what God has promised. And if you are Christ, you are an heir along with Abraham who becomes your father, and you're an heir of it because Abraham is your father and because God promised it to Abraham, how can you inherit it before Abraham? Now what about all of our loved ones that have already passed on? They are dead. Have they already inherited that promise? 
By faith, Abraham sojourned in the land of promise with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And if you're one of his children, you are, are an heir with him to that promise. Then Sarah is mentioned, and then coming to verse 13, these all died in faith. Now there's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah. These all died, and they are dead and are buried, as other scriptures affirm. They died in faith, not having received the promises. Abraham has not yet to this day received that promise. And that's exactly what Stephen said. And they stoned him to death for saying it. And I suppose a lot of people don't like me very well when I say the same thing. But that's exactly what is in the Bible. And it's the only truth of God. It's the message of God. Why is it that the carnal mind is so averse to God and is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God and hates it so much? Now, here was Stephen preaching. Let me see in the seventh chapter of Acts if I can find that particular part of it about Abraham here. He mentioned how Abraham had not received the promise at all. Here where God was saying, I am the God of thy fathers. This is in verse 32. Verse 32. The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And so on. Anyhow, he mentions back here at the beginning in the fifth verse. And God gave him, Abraham, none inheritance in it in this land. No, not so much as to set foot on as an inheritance, that is. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession. That's part of the message that Stephen preached for which he was stoned to death. The first Christian martyr. The very first Christian to be put to death and martyred. Now, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. When a man dies, he's corruptible and subject to decay, that is, and the body does decay. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That is, let me translate it for you, because what he means is we'll not all be dead. Of course, people don't believe it's asleep today, but that's the word that Paul used. But we shall all be changed. We'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, at the last trump, that Christ comes, the second coming of Christ. He says, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, when they died, they were corruptible. They were mortal. They were flesh and blood when they died. And they were corruptible and uh, subject to rotting and decay. But the dead, even though they died, and this pertains to Abraham, it pertains to Isaac and Jacob, the children with him of the same promise, heirs with him, that pertains to you if you are Abraham's children, if you are Christ's, that pertains to our loved ones who died in Christ. They will be resurrected. And here, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Some of us will be alive. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead, here's what happens to our loved ones, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, immortal, if they were dead in Christ. And we, we alive, shall be changed. For this corruptible, which is what we human beings are now, must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. You don't already have it. You were not born with immortality. He says you must put on immortality. You are corruptible. Jesus preached that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You must be born again, and that which is born of the Spirit, when you're born again, you must be born of the Spirit. And that which is born of the Spirit, he said, is spirit. I can't see spirit. You can't feel. You can't touch spirit. And so anyone who has become spirit can't be seen or touched or anything of the kind. But we are born of the flesh, and we are flesh. You can see flesh, and you can touch flesh, and that's what we are. But this corruptible, which is flesh and blood, must put on incorruption this mortal which we are now. Everywhere the Bible says we're mortal, not immortal. This mortal must put on immortality. Jesus Christ brought immortality to light through the gospel. And it is the gift of God. And he made it possible, and he told us to seek for it. And here's where we put it on. 
So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now when is it? At the last trumpet, the second coming of Christ, when we're changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now that's what Jesus preached, it's what the Bible says all the way through consistently, and yet people believe just the opposite today. When you were born, my friends, I've said it so many times, you didn't know anything. You didn't have any ideas that you were immortal or that the soul is immortal or anything like that when you were born. You look at a newborn baby just born today and it doesn't know anything about those things. Not a thing. Now where did you get it? You've heard it preached. Where do you get the faith in it? Because you have faith in men and the kind of people that taught it and that believe it. You're having faith in people. You're believing a lot of false preaching and a lot of that is not true. You couldn't prove it scientifically. You can't prove it in a chemist's laboratory. You can't prove it by any scientific methods. And certainly the Bible doesn't say it. Then why believe a lot of pagan lies of the devil? And it's nothing but a lie, and most people believe it today. Well, Jesus said, if we believe on him, and that includes believing his message, and you can't believe it if you don't obey it and do it, that he should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day when this mortal puts on immortality. Now the Jews therefore murmured concerning him because he had said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. And of course all this multitude of people there that he had fed, they were all Jewish people because it was a land where the Jews lived in that time. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I am come down out of heaven? Well, he's just an ordinary man. That's the way they looked on him. They didn't believe that he was any Messiah. They didn't look on him as any great personage, that he was the son of God. Well, he was just the son of Joseph and Mary. So they thought. He was not actually the son of Joseph at all, but he was the son of Mary, but he also was the son of God. Jesus answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come unto me except the Father which sent me draw him. You believe that today, my friends? Oh, I tell you, they've turned the Bible upside down. You can just continue reading right through the New Testament, any place in the Bible, and it teaches exactly the opposite of what you have had stuffed in your mind since the day you were born. Now, isn't that true? What do you hear preach today? They come and say, I'm a minister of Jesus Christ. They come in his name. They use his name. They preach about his person. And because they tell you he is the Christ, because they exalt him and deify him, which they should, then you say, well, he's preaching the truth. I must believe this man. And then when they tell you that you're an immortal soul, and when they tell you a lot of these things, well, you just swallow that. Look, lie and sink or two, because you have faith in the man, because he preached a little truth. You know what we have in this world? It isn't all error. It isn't all evil. It is good mixed with evil. It's a mixture. But good and evil mixed together is a very bad mixture. And that's what we have in this world. And you have truth mixed with error. And the trouble now is that we don't search out the truth and extract the error. It's a case of, for instance, sifting out the chaff from the wheat. Jesus answered and said, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come unto me except the Father which sent me draw him. Well, people don't believe that. Why, they believe that anyone can come to Christ, whoever wants to. The people today believe that no man can become converted. Do you hear much preaching? Do you hear a minister today in an evangelistic audience out before a big crowd and say that not any of you could possibly come to Jesus. None of you can be saved except the Spirit of God draw you. That you can't just make up your mind you want to be converted. You ever hear an evangelist say that? Why, of course not. Why, they tell you that you can make up your mind and be converted. Just come on up the aisle here and come up to this altar or shake my hand or whatever the formula is that he has and his little group of men. Do they preach what Jesus did? I tell you, nay. When will you wake up, my friends? Blow the dust off your Bible. Are you looking in your own Bible to see this with me? This is in the sixth chapter of John and that that I just read to you, the 44th verse. 
John 6, verse 44, Jesus answered and said unto them, Murmur not of yourselves, no man can come unto me, except the Father which sent me draw him. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, You haven't chosen me, I chose you. Jesus picked them out. Now what about others that he didn't choose? They couldn't come to him, and they didn't. His disciples didn't decide for themselves they wanted to be Christians. They didn't decide they wanted them as ministers. How do people get to be ministers today? Well, they just decide for themselves they want to be ministers. You know why in about nine out of ten cases? Because they think it's the easiest way and the most desirable way of earning a living because they prefer to do it to anything else. Now, I won't say to what extent the lazy instinct uh, permeates that desire because they think it's an easier job than some other, but if you're the kind of minister that God has always made me, I tell you, you won't find it's a very easy job. It's been a pretty hard job. I've worn myself out in it, I know, but I believe that through the power of God and the strength which he and he alone can impart that I still have another good 20 years left in me, I hope, and... Uh, I, I feel that perhaps I may have to use it about that much longer, but I'll have to draw on the strength of God. You know that you can get strength from God. Read the 40th chapter of Isaiah, the latter part of it. God is a God of strength, and he gives strength to those that rely on him. And I have to call on a great deal. And I find that it works. I, I receive it. Now, let's read the rest of that sentence. I didn't finish the sentence. No man can come unto me except the Father which sent me draw him. And in another place he says the Spirit of the Father, because the Father does it through the Holy Spirit. And, let's continue the sentence, and Jesus says, I will raise him. Who's that? The one that the Father calls and that comes to him. I will raise him up in the last day. Now, there is a resurrection, and he's to be raised up in the latter day. People don't believe that today. You don't hear that kind of preaching today. It is written in the prophets. Now, he's quoting directly from Isaiah 54, verse 13. And they shall all be taught of God. Everyone that hath heard from the Father and hath learned cometh unto me. Now get that. Everyone that has heard from the Father and learned does come unto Jesus. Well, not very many have had what we call then saving knowledge. Not many have opened their minds to receive it. And not many who have heard it and understood it, not many have learned it, which means to actually accept it and act upon it, and they will come to him. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is from God, he meant himself. He hath seen the Father. Well, I'm going to have to break off right there. The time is up, and oh my, we're coming to some wonderful truths, and it's exactly the opposite of what everybody seems to believe today. And I want to continue on right in this sixth chapter of John. And now finally, let me remind you, if you want to really understand your Bible, if you're willing to set yourself to devote a half hour or more every day to Bible study, you may enroll now for the Ambassador College Bible Correspondence Course. There is no tuition. And so goodbye, friends, until tomorrow.